well. Let me tell you my, briefly my story. Um, I'm from Baltimore. Um, I, my, my last name is Rubenstein, and you think if a name like that, you might be somebody who is from a wealthy family. My father's a doctor or lawyer, but my father um, dropped out of high school to go into World War II as part of the Marines, came back, he met my mother, they got married, uh, neither graduated from high school. My father worked in the post office his entire life, made about $7,000 at the peak. So I knew if I was going to get anywhere, I probably had to do it on my own. Uh, in the sixth grade, I heard a speech that was given not far from here. I watched it on television. Some of you may be old enough to remember this speech. It was given by John Kennedy. And he said in his famous inaugural address, which was only 14 minutes, the greatest inaugural address, I think, of the 20th century, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I studied that speech. My teacher drilled it into our heads. And I just said, OK, I want to do something for my country. Making money meant nothing to me. My parents had no money. I didn't think about making money. So I said, I want to do something to help my country. So ultimately, I decided the way I could do it was to go to law school and ultimately work in government and do something that might help my country if I did a good job in government. So I got a scholarship to Duke University. I got a scholarship to the University of Chicago Law School. And then I went to work in a law firm in New York that a partner at which was the man who wrote that speech for John Kennedy. His name was Ted Sorensen, the greatest presidential speechwriter, I think, of all time. And after a few years of working for him, um, he sort of hinted maybe that I wasn't such a great lawyer, maybe I should do something different. <laughs> and I talked to my clients, and I said, well, you know, I might do something different. What do you think? They said, now's a good time to leave. So I got the idea that I probably wasn't a great lawyer. And Ted Sorensen got me a, an interview with a man he said would be the next president of the United States. I could work in the White House just as he had done for President Kennedy. I got a job as the chief counsel for a man named Birch Bayh, who was running for president in 1976. 30 days after I joined his um, Senate staff, he dropped out of his presidential campaign. So I thought, uh-oh, maybe this happened to, some, to you as well. I wasn't a good lawyer. My clients didn't think I was good. My colleagues didn't think I was good. I went and joined a campaign in effect. It, it ended after 30 days. And then I got a call out of the blue. Some of you may have in your career as well. It said, uh, would you like to work for another man running for president? Who is this? Jimmy Carter. And I said, well, he's the peanut farmer from Georgia. And they said, yes, well, he's going to be the nominee for the Democratic Party in 76. I got the interview. I went down to Georgia. Jimmy Carter was 33 points ahead when I joined his campaign. He won by one point. So <laughs> he, he often said to me, you know, what did you really contribute? But White House staffs are not filled on merit. They're filled on who worked in the campaign. So I became the deputy domestic policy advisor to the President of the United States at the age of 27, three years out of law school. I wasn't qualified for that job. He wasn't qualified for his job, so I figured we'd fit in. Um, <laughs> I managed to get inflation to 19% in my job. Very difficult to get inflation to 19%. Nobody's done it since. Um, there was a rumor that I was going to be promoted in the second term to be the senior domestic advisor if Carter's reelected. And on the strength of that rumor, President Carter thinks he lost the election. So I had to go find a job. I went back and practiced law in Washington. It took me many months to convince somebody I knew how to do something in practicing law after finding myself being humiliated because I was a White House aide one day. The next day, I couldn't get a job in practicing law. Finally, somebody felt sorry for me. I practiced law. But once again, my client said to me, you know, this might not be for you. And I said to my, my partners, what do you think about this? Should I stay? And they said, maybe not. So I decided I would leave. And I took a chance. I read that on average, an entrepreneur starts a company between the ages of 28 and 37. And I read that when I was 37. So I said, OK, I'm going to start a company. So without knowing anything about finance, I decided to start something called the Carlisle Group. And I started in Pennsylvania Avenue. I recruited three people who actually knew something about finance. I told them I had some money, but I really was exaggerating. I told them when they showed up, I would get the money. So ultimately, uh, we started a company with $5 million. Today, we manage $200 billion. And it's turned out to be one of the largest private equity firms in the world. When I hit the age of 54, Forbes magazine put a story out about my net worth and my partner's net worth. And it became obvious to me that I had made so much money that I couldn't possibly spend it on, on houses and planes and boats and so forth, which I didn't really care much about anyway. So I decided what I would try to do is atone for my sins, getting inflation to 19%, and maybe give it back to the US government, give back to the US government, give back to my country. But I wasn't sure how to do it. And it came about in a kind of uh, unusual way. One day, I was invited to an, uh, an auction in New York. I was told I would be able to see the Magna Carta. And I said, how can you see the Magna Carta? It's in England. Well, it turned out there are 17 copies of the Magna Carta, and I had a chance to, to see one of them. It was the only one in private hands. I decided that I would try to buy that and make sure it stayed in the United States, because it was probably going to be auctioned off, I was told by the auctioneer, and leave the country. So I went back that next night. I bought it, 
and I've now put it on display at the National Archives. It'll be there permanently. And I said, I'll do this for the, for the country as a way to kind of make sure this document, which was the inspiration for the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution stays here. And then other documents came available, the Declaration of Independence, the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, which freed slaves, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. And I bought rare copies of them and put them on display at the State Department, the National Con uh, Constitution Center, the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, as a way of saying to Americans, take a look at these and learn more about your history. In a recent Pew survey, it turned out that 35% of Americans, when asked what river did George Washington cross during the Revolutionary War, said the Rhine River. Not th that's not true. 33% of Americans, when they asked who was the first Treasury Secretary, didn't know it was Alexander Hamilton. They said it was Larry Summers. So my theory is that Americans don't know enough about their history, and you can be a better uh, citizen if you know more about your history. So I'm trying to buy these historic documents and put them on display, make sure people know more about our history as a way of introducing them to our history. Another thing happened by serendipity as well. One time I was at the Kennedy Center, and the man on the board was the head of the Park Service. He told me the Washington Monument had suffered earthquake damage. I told him, I'll tell you what, I'll put up the money. Just ignore the government and the usual constraints. Forget Congress. Tell me how much it costs. I'll put up the money to fix it. So he did. He later came back and said Congress wanted to share the credit because they weren't getting a lot of good credit. So they said, can they put up half the money? I said, OK. So I just put up the money to repair the Washington Monument. Some of you may have seen the scaffolding there from time to time. And then I came up with the idea that, well, that was a good idea, but why not fix other historic things so I decided to help fix up Monticello, Thomas Jefferson's home, Montpelier, James Madison's home, Mount Vernon, George Washington's home, the Custis Lee Mansion at the top of Arlington, and some other things that I'll announce uh, down the road. And so what I've decided to do is to fix these historic buildings, in part because I want to remind Americans of their history and try to do what I'm now called patriotic philanthropy, which means giving back to your country. And all of us have probably been benefited from this country more than we might think. If I had grown up with my last name and with my modest means in another country, I don't think I would have been able to do what I've been able to do. So I want to dedicate my life now to giving back to the country. I signed the giving pledge. I was the only person in the private equity industry and, the, and one of the first 40 people that signed the giving pledge, which says you're going to give away half your money. But I've decided to give away all my money on the theory that my children really aren't going to be benefiting from all this money. Now, they may not agree with that completely, but... Um, <laughs> There's no evidence that people that inherit $500 million go on to win a Nobel Peace Prize for doing something wonderful. Usually the people who do great things in their life are people that don't inherit enormous sums of money. Uh, there's obviously exceptions. But, but I thought that my kids would be better off if they really had the modest means uh, going along that I had and give them more drive. So I'm trying to give away my money in ways that say to the country, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. But I try to remind people you don't need to be wealthy to be a philanthropist. You don't need to be wealthy to help your country. Philanthropy is an ancient Greek word that means loving humanity. It doesn't say rich people writing checks. So you can give your time, your, your energy, your ideas, whatever it, can, it might be, you can be a great philanthropist. I think Wendy Kopp, who created Teach for America, she didn't have a lot of money, but she created that, that organization which has helped America a great deal, and she's a great philanthropist in my view. I don't like it when you see the great list of philanthropists and it only lists how much money they've given, not how much time or energy or ideas they might have given to the country. But think back on this, uh, all of you. Uh, what have you done to help your country? All of you probably have come from different backgrounds, but all of you have benefited from the, the freedoms and the rights and, and that this country has. Now, we're not a perfect country, for sure. We've struggled for many years to get certain rights, and we still don't have all these rights. But still, it's an extraordinary country, and it's going to be made even more extraordinary if we get citizens to want to give back to the country, not just take from the country. So in my modest means, what I'm trying to do is to say, I will buy historic documents, make sure that people see them, and that they're part of our country's history forever. And, and people can see them all the time whenever they want to see them and learn more about history. Keep, fix up our historic monuments, not because they're the most important things in our country. There are many more important things. But it's a way of saying this symbolic uh, representation of our country is worth your knowing about it. Learn more about the history of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, the Founding Fathers. Because if you do so, you can be a better informed citizen. Now, if you're selfish, you could say to yourself, why should I be a philanthropist? Why should I give back? Why don't I just give money to myself and buy homes? Well, think about this. The great philanthropists live a long time. So you could look at it selfishly. John D. Rockefeller lived to be 97. David Rockefeller just turned 100. I have a theory that God looks favorably on people who give away their money. He keeps them on earth for a long time. So no philanthropist drops dead very quickly. So if you're just selfish about it, if you want to live a long time, give away your money or give away your time, your energy, your ideas, because I think there's a very good thing uh, uh, that's likely to await you. Now, I do have a theory that not only will you live a long time, but there's a special place in heaven reserved for people that do philanthropy. Now, I can't prove that, but why would you want to take a chance, right? <laughs> so, it's very important, I think, in this country 
that people should learn more about the history of the country, learn more about how we got where we are, the mistakes we made, so that we can avoid repeating these mistakes. And I think all, everybody here should look back and what they're doing with their life. You're only on this earth for a very short period of time. You know, if you're lucky, 80 years, 85 years, 90 years if you're very lucky. But, and that's a very short span of time, really, when you consider that humans have been on the earth for maybe a million years or so, and you're gonna be here for a short period of time. Don't get to your deathbed and say, I wish I had done something to help my country. I wish I had done something to help my community. Do it when you're younger. Don't wait till you're 54 years old. Don't wait till you do the kind of things I did. Do it younger and make it part of your DNA. And I think if we can do that and we can get young people to do this and we can get people to get their children to do it, the country will be a better place. Very often we take for granted the great rights and freedoms this country has given us. While it's not a perfect country, it's a better country in my view than any other country with the freedoms and rights and the opportunities that we have. And so I think we should do something to say thank you to the country from time to time, not in an unduly patriotic way, not in a way that makes patriotism something that is, is something you can hide behind, but something that if you're not uh, afraid of, of being patriotic. I'm not afraid of saying I'm a patriotic philanthropist. I'm giving back to the country because I'm proud of being an American. I'm proud that I was able to do what I'm able to do, and I'm proud that the country made it possible for me to do this. So all of you, if you think about what you're doing with your life, think about what more you might be able to do if you just spent a little time giving back to the country in some modest way. It doesn't have to be rep repairing a monument or buying a document, but just something that you can do that you can say later in life or even now, yes, I've done something to give back to my country, and yes, I've done something to make the world a slightly better place. All of us are on this earth for periods of time that are relatively short, as I mentioned. Nobody knows why we're really here, but presumably we're here to make the world a slightly better place, and we shouldn't wait until the end of our life and say, uh oh, I better do something for the next last five years of my life. Do it earlier and don't, don't hesitate to do so and don't worry only about your career, worry about helping the country as well. Thank you very much.